2023. I'm Ruth Trimarkey, Chair of the Winchester Board of Health, and I call this regularly scheduled meeting to order. The meeting is being recorded. Roll call vote for attendance. Greg Sawicki? Here. Ms. Pimentel? Here. Okay, and uh, is there anything that the board members or health director would like to add uh, to the today's agenda or comment on? Not seeing anything. Um, I don't see any members of the public. Are we good to skip that first agenda item or is there someone waiting in the wings? Okay. Then I think, Jen, if you're ready, we could jump right into the director's update. Oh, hi, Raymond. Welcome. Happy New Year. Okay, everyone see that screen? Yes. Yep. Great. Um, yeah, that's better. What? Okay, so where are we in terms of viral illnesses right now? Um, Obviously, there was a spike in viral illnesses. Um, basically, COVID since you know Thanksgiving around Thanksgiving time, a little before Thanksgiving time, which sort of uh, increased from that point forward. Same trend as as last year through the holidays when people gathered. RSV was spiking and uh, really taxing the healthcare system. That uptick started to happen sometime in October, very early early on. And then flu, same thing, was a very early um, sign that this was going to be a bad flu season very early on as well. And it's it's continued to, um, we've continued to see cases out there. Again, all of this taxing the healthcare system and the hospitals. I'm not sure if we're at the, at the beginning of seeing a little bit of relief. I know, um, and Greg, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the uh, number of RSV illnesses has reduced slightly uh, recently, uh, we've seen uh, a little bit of that trend over the last few days with COVID as well. I think it's it's early to talk about maybe um, you know a dramatic decrease in anything. I think everyone still needs to be vigilant. Sorry, Greg, did you want to chime well, I was in? I'm saying RSV definitely seems to have peaked. Flu and COVID are the things that we're seeing more and more of. Yeah. Okay. Right. Sure. So so again, illness is still impacting the healthcare system right now. For Middlesex County, we are considered at um, high risk of COVID transmission. That's based on the CDC designation. And then for flu, the state DPH has labeled us as very high. And that, that pertains to um, not only our state, but actually this particular area of Middlesex County. It's not exactly Middlesex County, the way they broke it out. It's a little bit odd configuration of towns and cities. Nonetheless, it, we are in an area that's labeled as very high, you can see here. Um, and we've been seeing um, a lot more hospitalizations than we have, uh, flu-related hospitalizations than we have in the past three seasons at this same time. So again, it's, it's causing um, a bit of severe illness. Hopefully folks receive their flu vaccine. Hopefully, you know, the same precautions we're taking to uh, prevent the transmission of COVID and RSV. It's the same thing with flu, you know, uh, masks and other things. We have the tools and our capability to try to prevent and thwart spread of the illness. And I do want to reference back here to the health advisory that was published last Friday. I think it was Friday. It's up on our website, both the Board of Health page, the Health Department page. It was also uh, put out on Facebook, I believe Ruth mentioned you put it out on the residents page. We have yet to push it out on Facebook and Twitter on the town's pages only because we are a, you know, our staff member who's responsible for that and has all the permissions is out right now. So we will do that as soon as possible, but hopefully the word is spreading throughout the community about this advisory. And given that, you know, we are in, we are labeled as high according to CDC for COVID transmission. It makes sense to do all those things you see here in the advisory, especially if you are yourself uh, immunocompromised in some way, you're elderly, 
Um, don't forget, we're seeing uh, most severe illness and death in the very old. Also, if you visit folks or around people who are immunocompromised as well, it's a good idea to mask up. Also, test before you get together with those people. It's the same tools that we've been talking about for quite some time now, for a few years anyway. Um, and as a reminder, we do still have COVID test kits. We actually got a new free supply. I had planned on buying some more home test kits. Didn't need to because the state uh, pulled through with a large supply. So I did share that with the schools. So they now have a replenishment of antigen tests and masks, um, as well as uh, us at health department. So we have masks and at home test kits for anyone who needs it. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, regarding the, the vaccinations, I think I mentioned in December that we were considering ho holding a booster clinic for uh, those under five years old or five and under. And it's a little bit more complicated than holding, for us to be able to hold just to sort of a generic public clinic. I think we're gonna do it by appointment basis we haven't received that many calls about it. There's not a demand. We actually reached out by email to all those who participated in the primary series clinic for that age group. And we only had maybe one or two people who were interested for their child. So what we'll do is we'll promote that though to the community and see if we can do it on an appointment basis only because the it just gets tricky, you know, uh, Moderna is a, or Moderna is a two dose series, Pfizer was a three dose series at that age. And it, it gets a little complicated if you haven't had the full three dose series and you're coming to get the Moderna, you know, bivalent booster. So we really want to make sure we dot our I's, cross our T's and are doing everything appropriately and getting folks the booster that they need for the appropriate age. So Karen's going to go uh, and look at that and strategize about that. and will look to promote that relatively soon, but she's also thinking about holding another clinic for anyone in uh, the other age brackets um, and will order more vaccine to get the uh, bivalent booster out there and do another clinic in that in the older age groups. And Scott, so- we, I think Dot's trying to ask a question. Oh, Are sorry. you muted, Dot? Yes, I, thank you. Jen, um, Karen's trying to get in. Uh-oh. Do you see her? Sorry, um, I can't see her at the same time. I'm in. <laughs> oh, sorry. Ruth, she, are you a co-host? Can you see? I am, but I'm not seeing it either. Be, I think in the. I don't know. Let me just. Let's see. Participants, will that view it? No. I don't see her. It's possible she. She said I'm on call, but haven't started yet. So I don't know what that means. Hmm. Could you just text her back and Ruth will keep an eye out for her maybe? Okay, sure. Thank okay. you. Okay. Oh, there she is, got her. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, Ruth, you created this health advisory. Did you utilize Canva? Yeah, oh, that was the first good. time I used it. Thank you for uh, introducing me. It's good fun. Good, good. I think it's relatively easy um, software to use. Anyway, yeah. So this health advisory is out. Um, again, this graphic is just from um, the state regarding flu. Anyone can go on to Mass Department of Public Health and find um, the weekly flu data um, there. And so I simply, you know, screenshot this table that they have presented there so we also have i'm pretty sure and karen you can chime in do we have any flu vaccine left i think it expires shortly but all right if you want to chime in at some point karen feel free and if not pl anyone please call our office um, for a flu vaccine uh, regarding the COVID update, I'm sure everyone has heard in the news about the XBB 1.5 uh, subvariant, which is a descendant of, of Omicron. It seems to be very transmissible, although I feel like I say this with every iteration of, of a, of a subvariant or a variant, you know, every, every time there's a mutation that latches hold, I feel like it's more transmissible than the next, which, you know, you got to give this thing a little credit. It certainly knows how to survive, right? It replicates millions of times in a host and Eventually, if you have enough transmission, something's going to stick, and lo and behold, we have XBB 1.5. Uh, right now, it accounts for more than, or approximately, 
um, a little over more than 70% of the cases in this area in the northeast part of the country. Um, currently, again, as of today, from everything I'm reading, being told as we're talking to, to people about this uh, epidemiological evidence that we have, currently we're not seeing more severe illness with XBB15, although you know it's still a little bit early to tell. However, and this thing is still uh, spreading widely. And that's why you're hearing about probably more illness out there due to COVID, whether your holidays were ruined a bit because someone in your family was ill. I know I have a lot of that in my neighborhood. Um, so again, it's highly transmissible. If you've been boosted, you seem to be in better shape. I know that folks are hearing that this, you know, the subvariant can evade immunity. However, there still seems to be that the bivalent booster offers some protection because it will generate antibodies that recognize BA2 or the, you know, one of the um, original descendants. So it still proves uh, beneficial for folks to take advantage of the um, of the bivalent booster. Um, obviously, we have treatments available for COVID as we have for some time now. Monoclonal antibodies don't seem to be the way to go with XBB. However, we have antivirals like Paxlovid, et cetera, that can help. So, um, and you don't need to talk to your physician if people don't have a primary care physician or it's tough to get through to that person. If you call DPH, if you call the 211 number, they will help you. You can actually be prescribed based on, you know, what your discussion with that provider um, and your call with DPH. They can prescribe to you Paxlovid or something similar. You don't need to necessarily go to your primary care physician for that. So it may be worth a phone call. Again, if you're in that bracket of being older, if you're immunocompromised, that phone call to your primary care physician or DPH4 treatment will be very beneficial to you if it can be prescribed to you. I think people are a little bit hesitant because of the Paxlovid rebound effect Again, something to talk about with your primary care provider and weigh the pros and cons of that decision. Jen, I have a question, if I may. Yep. Um, is it too early to have any projections at all on the effect long-term, <laughs> long-haul COVID from this variant as distinct from any of the previous ones? I haven't heard or read any data about that now, Ruth. Mm -hmm. I think, okay. you know, obviously getting the booster, obviously getting treatment to reduce your, your symptoms, to reduce your viral load, especially will be more, mm -hmm. uh, probably offers you more protection about any of those long-term consequences. But I can't say for sure whether or not that same sort of 10% of the total number of cases is gonna, who would suffer long-term COVID is going to be the same as previous, uh, as previous variants. I don't know that. Thank you. Um, this is just to show, this is the MWRA wastewater data, and it's simply to show, um, draw the comparison. While I was saying that, you know, XBB is certainly 1.5 is more transmissible and seems to be spreading with ease, we are certainly not experiencing the volume of cases as we did this time or around this time last year. I'm sure you can all remember with, with the beginning of the original Omicron, you can see that giant spike um that is on this chart and then we are to the obviously all the way to the far right on this chart there's just no comparison however you know it's still spreading it's still mutating and there are still things to be concerned about and vigilant of and again this is the wastewater data so right now this is going to give us our best source that this is our best source of information as to the prevalence of infection and prevalence of disease in our uh, in this area in the northeast of the state, and hospitalizations. Um, this is a snapshot from DPH. It's a seven-day average of hospital hospitalizations of uh, people who have COVID who are in the hospital. It doesn't mean that all of these 1,200 plus cases were hospitalized because of COVID as the primary reason. In fact, just a third of those cases are actually the primary reason for the hospitalization. However, it's still something to be mindful of. Um, 
But again, we are in a lot better shape. You can see our, the previous history of COVID hospitalizations from 2020 on, on the left of the screen, to where we are all the way to the right of that table. So again, something to watch. Hopefully, as we're seeing wastewater data come down a little bit over the past five days or so, we would expect to see a couple weeks out the same trend for hospitalizations. But again, it's a little bit early, but something to keep our eye on. And I just want to point out that the seven day average for confirmed deaths remaining relatively low. Um, the average age of death for this time period, the seven day average was uh, 81 years old. The average age of infection, just as a side note, was 41 years old. I don't know. Oh, there we go. Does anybody have anything to add or or other um, questions about COVID or flu? Jen, just a, a quick question. Uh, I think too last um, last meeting we 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 had talked about just sort of overall flu vaccination rate, but the state data doesn't break down by county or town, right? So we don't really know what percentage of Winchester residents have gotten flu shots. No, and we, we actually called the state grid after our last meeting to try to inquire about that. And we said, hey, you know, you can break out this data for for COVID vaccinations. And that was brilliant. You know, we reproduced yeah. it on our dashboard and they said, oh, that's a great suggestion. OK, yeah, no, I'm just <laughs> I'm just curious, you know, like because because, uh, you know, I think that's some, you know, those are that's the data that they right. probably have. But it's, that's 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 fine. And then my my other question again and comment is, you know, thanks for your work with uh, the schools over the break in terms of getting the messaging out through the schools. I think that was very helpful. Um, I have a, I'm wondering, you know, given sort of the other areas in town where you have at risk populations, particularly seniors, is there any any uh, change in messaging with the Jenks or any other programs that the town is involved in with, with seniors in terms of either you know congregate facilities or the Jenks in particular? Not that I have heard, and I haven't heard that they, um, you know, they went back to masking or, you know, they got rid of their vaccination requirement to enter the building as well as um, ma mandatory masking, that is. Um, but they are kept in the loop with all of our communications through our digital dose, including this health advisory. But I, I haven't been told that they have upped any of their uh, precautions as a mandate, per se. Sure, no, I'm just, just curious what, what can, you know, obviously, the, I know that the communication with the schools is 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 through you and, 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 the, and the work, and that's been great. I just didn't know if there was, in particular, anything from, from that. And then in Town Hall, I know I noticed, actually, when I was in town hall last week that more people were masking than before. And but that's probably just based on sort of advisory. There's not been anything new from town manager, right? In terms of town No, manager. there hasn't. And that's all been, um, as you say, just just, you know, people choosing to do that on their own. Um, I know there's been a bit of illness as there is everywhere here. So within town hall, so people are, you know, trying to be as protective as possible, sure. you know, even if they're negative for COVID, they just don't want to they just don't want to share their germs with anybody. So it's actually been, it's actually, people have been very cautious here. And I've noticed downtown, you know, when I walk around or go into any store down there, I've, I see more and more people masking, which is great to see. Thanks. Um, okay, we are at subdivision. And so, um, I wanted to raise this subject because by statute, the Board of Health is obligated to review um, definitive and draft subdivision plans. And that's essentially any time um, a development occurs that will either build a new road or extend a portion of a pre-existing road. Um, a developer is obligated to have this approved by the planning board, obviously, but the statute also requires a review by the Board of Health. So you actually get to weigh in and make recommendations for approval or disapproval of a subdivision plan. Now, these don't come up that often. Um, and historically, you know, previous boards have, a, have just deferred to the health department to, to make a review or, and make recommendations to the planning board. Um, but I, you know, I raise this as an issue for you so that you should collectively decide what you would like to do. I mean, some subdivisions are very straightforward like the one I believe was just shared with you for Rocky Ledge, that's a three single family home subdivision. And it's 
you know, really not something that's controversial. However, you know, there are issues there that pertain to public health potentially. And so I leave it up to you to discuss and decide whether or not you would like to see every subdivision plan that comes in uh, and bring it, I can bring those to a public meeting and two, whether or not you would like to invite the petitioner or the builder developer to come in to explain it and walk you through it, which is always more beneficial than sort of reading these on your own as they tend to be, you know, a bit, a bit long, <laughs> a bit large. Um, so I leave it up to you, but your recommendations after review would be around, it doesn't even have to be around straightforward public health regulations. It could be whatever you in your mind and your public health analysis would make sense and mm. be least injurious to public health, in other words. So your powers are very broad as they are actually in general when it comes to public health, but it's including review of subdivision plans. You can make recommend recommendations to the planning board that are not rooted in regulation, but are rooted in, you know, as I said, what you think is in the best interest of public health. And so um, this could be, for example, septic systems, water supply, uh, flooding in the area, although um, water supply and flooding tends to be handled by the town engineer. But we, you could also comment on, for example, trash storage, fill, whether someone's bringing soil in. Uh, you could comment on asbestos, lead. I mean, things that you feel could be a potential public health issue. Um, now, if you disapprove a plan, and we have and you have 45 days to either approve or disapprove and if you don't comment at all it's considered approval but if you disapprove of a plan the planning board can actually not approve a subdivision plan if the board of health makes a recommendation for disapproval so how and often are these coming up to you not often at all because in general people aren't creating new streets <laughs> excuse me so most uh, or they're not extending streets i mean that would probably be the most um, yeah the most likely thing would be the extension of a street but they don't come up often at all um the the most recent one i can think of was maybe abbey road off of highland that was a yeah. brand new road right um yeah, and so a lot of a lot of developers do, are allowed to develop, but don't have to go through the through the subdivision plan, right? If they're just um, rehabbing, if a street already exists you know, or a property exists, and they're demoing and rebuilding, or if they're renovating and extending, um, you know, a property, a building itself, you wouldn't need to comment. So if it's a development off of an existing street where it's just a straight driveway and the development's right there that doesn't fall under our purview okay not by statute um what the zba typically does is allows us to comment they send it to us yeah. anyway and so we do get we do get to comment and those are many you know how much construction is in this town right? absolutely <laughs> those are so, many um how often you've been here for pushing 20 years here so seeing quite a few of these developments come through how often do you comment on it and what are the, is there a, the general is it uh, all over the map or there's three or four topics which often you have to suggest need beefing up yeah so i mean if you're asking me what i would recommend for you to review um well i'm asking you for historical information and then using that we would have a better sense of whether you know, I mean, I'd be interested for a while in seeing a few of these to understand more, but I'm just, just curious. Um, yeah, just, yeah, so, histo boy. Um, you don't have to answer today if, if you'd have to review that and think yeah. on that. Yeah, I think, I think the main, the main thing historically is that really needs careful review and a public meeting and a petitioner to to come and present would be large scale projects in this town, mm -hmm. whether they be required by statute as a subdivision or not. I would like for you to be involved and in the know on those. Um, and historically, our Board of Health has chosen not to do that. But I have brought forward larger scale projects and left the rest to be dealt with internally. It is uh, the Board of Health likely to be approached at any stage in the process on 
10 Converse or Waterfield or Lynch. I guess Lynch would be a separate category altogether. But um, yeah. Lynch is... what about the other large ones that are on the well, um so uh, the the vision the subdivision i think it's a subdivision off cambridge street the 40b yeah right river yeah. river something like that would be um i don't know if they're building a new road i don't think cambridge street came off as a subdivision i, I haven't seen anything yeah yeah yet, but okay. in other words okay. they're gonna build a road yeah or not i feel like that's the type of project that should come to your attention and review and perhaps a public discussion and review by the petitioner. Okay. Comments and questions from Maureen and Greg? That seems reasonable to me. Are you asking us, I, I obviously reviewed this, but are you asking us to review and make comments on this current subdivision or no? If you would like, uh, again, it, it's it's completely up to you. If you if you have if you see something, I, uh, Maureen, this one seems fairly straightforward. Yeah, uh, that's you know, as I as I said, it's three three single family homes, right? Um, but if you've already taken the time to review it, please let me know if you have any questions or comments. I, no, to me it seems pretty straightforward. And it seems like all the details are there, but I just didn't know if there was something glaring in your mind. No, this is the first time I've had to look at one of these as a board of health member. So, right. I think what in this town, what will always be the one of the main issues is flooding, right? Yeah. And what, okay. So uh, that, as I mentioned, is is handled by the town engineer. Um, so we don't necessarily have to get in into that, knowing that that topic is already covered. But other things, you know, the other things that I mentioned are also like septic system. That's something we'd be interested in, but nobody's putting in new septic systems and they, I don't, I don't believe they're putting one in here. So because they are not, they're going to tie in right to our municipal system that is also handled by the town engineer as well as DPW. There are implications with them as well. So Jen, if I go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I had understood from you that you would like us as a board to kind of give you a um, a sense of whether we would like the developer on this particular one to come forward and in and in the future how often we might like to see or categories we might like to see of developments is that did I get that correct yeah exactly I would just like to know from you would you like to see every one of these at a public meeting and hear from the petitioner or developer or not, or is there some threshold perhaps? You know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna give you too much for these public meetings, right? But it's a, it's completely up to you looking for, for direction. No, I or agree. I, think, I know, I think I think Jen, your your proposal and plan is fine to sort of if there are particularly if there are concerns on your end, you should absolutely bring them to us. But I think you know for the larger projects that makes sense for uh just let's just like you did this week, just to sort of bring it to our attention. I think that's totally fair. Sounds good to me. Is that, you all right with that, Maureen? Yeah, I think the larger, especially if there's controversy surrounding the project, I think it's also beneficial for us to know so that if people reach out to the board, we sort of have familiarity with the project. Good. Very good. Um, and I may have stopped sharing my screen before the last slide, but anyway, it was just to update the board on the inspector position that we have talked about. Uh, I did submit the budget proposal with a full-time inspector position in it for FY24. However, in the meanwhile, I did speak with our collaborative through the, that we have of surrounding towns with a public health excellence grant. It's monies from the state to meet statutory obligations. And our six town membership, we receive $300,000 every year. And we've been using it to try to do, you know, inspections in the field as we need. Some towns are more needy than others. Um, but it's so that we could benefit appropriately, so that Winchester could specifically benefit appropriately. Uh, the collaborative has agreed to fund a full-time inspector position starting February 1st for the remainder of this fiscal year. They would pay the Bennies 
and half of the position and Winchester will pay the other half of the position through June 30. So, so this is good um, to get to get someone um, who we already have two candidates who have been uh, trained through our grant actually. So the training has been ongoing for months and now they're ready to slide into one of uh, into an inspector role. And so uh, we will be able to hire that person hopefully after um, some interviewing and um, for February 1st. Now the question becomes leaving that position in the budget as a full-time ask for FY24 or keeping this arrangement with the public health excellence grant folks, which I haven't had that discussion yet. And I'm not sure if they, you know, because it'll only benefit two within the member communities. So I'm not sure we'll want to continue that. So my recommendation is we look to keep that ask for full-time position in our budget request. I know, uh, we may get pushed back on that as as you've all heard there's a shortfall in the fy24 budget of estimates are two and a half million um but nonetheless this position is needed do you think there's a potential of, of the collaborative continuing past this fiscal year to uh support the position in this way yeah so that's i'm going to have that conversation uh this month actually to find that out Okay. And so if it, if it is something that they can continue, I'll definitely let you know, and we can figure out if we want to revise our ask to the town. Great. Yeah, that sounds great. And when, when appropriate, when you need us to step up to the mic or whatever it is we need to do, you'll, we'll keep in close contact about that. Yep. And that's all I have. Thank you. That's all you have. Okay. Yep. As a minor footnote to um, Jen's discussion about our authorities on thing, I learned uh, on various things. I did learn from Jen um, something which both my colleagues should be aware of. I sort of knew about it, but had never reflected on it. Um, shopping one day um, came upon some foodstuffs with expired dates. And so drew that to Jen's attention and the inspector was sent out. I could have, of course, as a private citizen, just, you know, drawn that to the manager's report and had it removed from the shelves, but that would have lost probably an opportunity for um, correction of it. An alternative is any one of us can identify ourselves as a member of the Board of Health and inform the person, the manager, that there will be follow up from the health department. So um, that's just another thing that we have authority over, uh, should it ever be a situation where we felt in this case here, I didn't, you know, it's ham, it's not going to, you know, <laughs> it had a lot of nitrates in it. But uh, if you saw something else, um, we do have the authority to, to act more directly on that. Okay, um, moving forward on the agenda, then the next piece that we'll take a look at is a web page update. I sent both of my colleagues a proposal for it. It's pretty modest. Um, I can screen share and show that if you'd like, or we can, I, I just ask you first, what, um, what are your thoughts? It seemed fine to me, Ruth. I mean, if you want to screen share it, that's fine. It, it looked pretty straightforward. Um, agreed. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Bet that's not showing properly, is it? Let's see here. Um, are you able to see it? It says, yep. Yep. okay, all right, thank you very much. And I apologize for any um, techno pieces here. So the two proposals I'm making for the update to the Board of Health is a little bit more information on the text that's there. It's very brief now. I spent some period of time, as I mentioned to you, looking at various um, web pages for Boards of Health across the state and also looking for tone um, and content within the town website. So I came up with this. It basically is a small expansion on what we have. It puts our 
uh, reference for our authority as other pages on the town's web pay website do puts it front and center there gives a brief distinction between the board of health and the uh, health department um and that is let's take this in two pieces that is the first piece is the text is there any are there is there any feedback regarding the proposed expansion of the text okay okay the second proposal a uh, second part of the proposal is the buttons on the left which um are simply we've begun to have new topics and we've been adding those organically as we go along they're just added alphabetically i'm now suggesting as i uh gave you some forewarning along the way it reaches a point where it makes sense to cluster certain buttons together under topics and with the idea of expanding them as we need so the buttons I'm proposing um, would have the exact same links off of them. Gina has already put them up, our advisories, agendas, minutes. There's an additional one I was looking at uh, recently that I didn't send to you, but we might want to consider. It's an early history of public health in Winchester. It's written by the town historian, Ellen Knight. It's a 2021, like two page article, and it could be fun to have up there for, uh, but interesting the public. The link to the health department is as is, public comment would be as is. Regulations would be a new button. And again, our concern is we don't wanna have our webpage of the Board of Health simply be exactly the same as the health department. There's no reason for that. So um, the regulations that uh, we are responsible for, I gave you in this truncated um, chart, so it, eliminates all of the uh, permits that are on the health department page. The fee schedule we did vote recently, so I, that's in our wheelhouse and I left that up. Um, and then I clustered a bunch of others under uh, resources for current health problems, our current buttons for climate change, monkeypox, and reproductive health would go there to give you a sense of how that button could expand in the future we might want to put up stuff on the current flu, RSV, COVID, West Nile virus, triple E, um, you know, heat stuff. Feedback on uh, the clustering of the buttons and whether you like it or would like to change it. I might not use the word current because otherwise we can put things that are say quote unquote current mm. the website, they go out of date very fast. So I just, I just say resources for health concerns or public health concerns, maybe. Um, and uh, I mean, I think we have this. I, I think I think, you know, right now there's obviously COVID flu. I, I would actually separate out because there is a lot of sort of state and health department COVID resources. I would just put out separate out COVID and put, uh, you know, the, have it be a separate thing. And I honestly, I think Flu and RSV are very different things. That's a you know from a health perspective, in many ways, they're similar but different. But I think for sure, COVID should be separated out as its own button. Yeah. Okay. And then we talk every summer about tick-borne illnesses, so there should be obviously the resources there. Yes. Okay. Did you want that called out as a separate button or clustered under? Um, no, I think it's separate. I mean, those are all, yeah. I mean, you may want to. Okay. And we can always that, adjust this, but keep going. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think that, that would be my suggestion right now. Okay. Well, we'll get it. We'll get the formatting later, but yes. Um, and it's not alphabetical. All right. Um, Maureen, any suggestions beyond these? No, I think I agree with those changes and I think it looks good. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, stop sharing that and I'm going to now move to the, uh, a strategic plan. So I'm going to try again to uh, screen share this where, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay.
Are you seeing a first slide in a PowerPoint that says strategic planning? Okay, uh, this, what I have here is the start of a conversation. And this is a proposal to you, Greg and Maureen, that the Board of Health develop a strategic plan. So Jen and I um, spoke for about two hours about this uh, last week and uh, not last week, before vacation. And she is in agreement that if we decide as a board to go forward with this, that she would support it. And certainly the health director will be an integral part at every step in the process and ensuring that any board of health strategic plan is in alignment with the health department. So I want to acknowledge, um, certainly we have no complaints. They're doing a great job in the health department. I think we as a board are doing a great job as well. But I do think that um, sort of end of year reflection as I think back on what we're doing, I think there may be opportunities for improvement. So that's what we've got. That's what I'm gonna walk us through here. Um, the first question to be asked is obviously why undertake a strategic review and plan at this point in time? The obvious answer is to determine if there are opportunities for improved delivery of public health by the Winchester Board of Health also to support the health department in their long-term goals. And then a third reason for doing it is that my personal research indicates that there can be, there, that there are opportunities for improving what we're doing. So my research falls into three categories. One are guiding documents that I'm gonna show you in a minute. The other is that um, I've been dropping in on meetings of Massachusetts boards of health across the Commonwealth either directly live or looking at videos of videotapes of their meetings and reading minutes from Shelburne Falls to Northampton, Amherst, Worcester, uh, the towns all around us, Boston, Cambridge, and then conversations with key stakeholders. And I think collectively those say, might be a good idea if we take a look at doing a strategic plan. Right up front, we want I, I wanna say there's some, considerations if we go down this road. The first is a scope. So Winchester already has a high performing health department. So the scope of any Board of Health strategic plan would necessarily be far less than that it is if you look around and poke on other poke around other municipalities or you go on a national level and you look at local boards of health across the country, if small towns like ours, um, which they exist, uh, but there, you know, there may be a greater scope than we need to do here. Want to also acknowledge anybody has limited resources. We would certainly need to identify the resources we have and those we will need. And we also want to consider that we are volunteers, right? So we have limited radar screen. We have limited um, time. And the goal is not for a strategic plan to make more work for either the Board of Health or the Health de Department. It's instead to make the work that we choose to undertake be thoughtful, forward thinking, and have it keyed to identified needs of the community. We also would want to prioritize, as Jen and I talked about, you know, we could end up with a long list of tasks. And she says, well, you just prioritize it, right? Can't do it all the first year, but consider one, three and five year goals might be are kind of traditional. So these are the guiding documents that I referenced. The first two are where our authority comes from and what our responsibilities are. So Massachusetts General Law um, 111 has 243 sections to it and the Winchester Home Rule Charter they say uh, slightly different things, but you collectively, what they're really in the simplest terms say that we are charged with protecting the public health and the, the, the environment and public health for Winchester. And that includes not just residents, but people who work here and people who visit here. The next three documents here iterate what those responsibilities look like and how boards of health should go about putting them into place. I've chosen these three guiding documents, but there are many and I'm totally, you know, we if we choose to do this, we might add um, more guiding documents. The first one I have here is the legal handbook for Massachusetts Boards of Health, third edition, August, 2022, that Jen just sent us. 
I did read an earlier version of the, or look at an earlier version of that. This one's 206 pages. I read it cover to cover. It is very insightful for this question. Also, the Massachusetts Blueprint for Public Health Excellence. I've uh, referenced this to the board before, and I'm sure you've looked at it. It came out in June of 2019. So our Senator Jason Lewis and um, Cheryl Sabara, who's the um, Executive Director of Massachusetts Boards of Public Health, both had strong hands in uh, being architects of this particular document. It's further than the title of it continues on and it gives some insight into why it's so useful. Recommendations for improved effectiveness and efficiency of local public health protections. It's a report of the Special Commission on Local and Regional Public Health. The third guiding document that I looked at is the CDC, 10 Essential Public Health Services. So um, those are things I looked at. And then you ask the question, um, with all of those documents, and I kind of think of them as like a Venn diagram with different lenses, but overlapping. And what does that bullseye in the center say? And it's worded differently in different documents. I liked, uh, as I went through thinking about this question, this uh, process, I like the wording uh, throughout this of what's in the legal handbook. And it writes, um, local boards of health are primarily responsible for for providing public health services to their communities and protecting those they serve from environmental health risks, utilizing a three-pronged approach. So the next slide shows what those three prongs are on one side, and then on the other side of the next slide, it says, how is Winchester measuring up against those three prongs? And understand, this is just me. This is just my own assessment. So. This is a quote from the legal document. What are our responsibilities? One, assess the health needs of the community as a whole. Two, once those needs are identified and quantified, the board must develop policies and procedures to address those health needs. And three, assure that the resources are pro procured and deployed in a manner consistent with its goals of meeting the health needs. So this is my assessment of how we as a board of health are measuring up, anybody can object. <laughs> um, regarding assessing the health needs, there are a number of health needs assessment documents that we have access to. And those are coming up on a, uh, another slide in a minute. We have one, I think everyone here remembers the youth risk behavior um, assessment that was done in 2021 to be repeated this year. That is current and it's actionable. There are a number of community-wide uh, needs assessments. Those are current from 2018 and forward uh, to now. I ask the question of whether they perhaps are not as comprehensive as might be appropriate at this point in uh, time. Regarding developing policies, we do that on an ongoing basis. We just finished an update on the tobacco policy. Um, so that's ongoing, but I would suggest that we are, have, do not yet do that comprehensively. We haven't looked at it comprehensively and we certainly haven't quantified anything. We may not need to, I don't know. I haven't really, you know, I, I during the conversation with Jen, um, we did, uh briefly touch upon the fact that some of what we we are charged with doing is by Massachusetts general law some is by uh bylaws that we don't vote on those are voted on by town meeting but we're responsible for them and those are in the book of the uh, bylaws um, and some are our own regulations so there's a range um regarding resources that's ongoing we have our current immediate goal of looking at moving the part-time uh, position in the health department to full-time. Again, I would say maybe we haven't looked at what resources are needed in a comprehensive way. Spoken with Jen about long-term wish lists, you know, wish, wishes, if you will, and prioritize those over time, um, uh, wishes and needs. One might ask the question, why do responsibilities change? The legal handbook did ask that question. Why isn't it like, you know, the same as last year or 10 years ago, whatever. They write in a, uh, I think it's a nice 
quote here. The challenge is in the fluid nature of risk and prevention. Differing issues spawn differing needs. Science evolves, opening new opportunities on one side or presenting new challenges on the other. And regulations from the state and federal governments redefine the overall regulatory scheme, forcing local boards to be vigilant in order to stay current. If we go forward, I would suggest that there are two immediately obvious things we might want to consider and, uh, and look at. One is to examine the existing community needs assessment, and the other is to learn from others, namely, you know, similar, uh, um, forgive me, that's, uh, I'm sure spam. Um, the other is to look at similar municipalities to our own. So regarding the first, examine community needs assessment, I, I would ask the question, do the existing CNAs include all current community voices? Um, there's a difference between a statistic and a bar graph acknowledging we have certain ethnicities in town and to actually have voices that we are hearing in terms of needs, for example. Um, many, uh, so in Winchester at this point in time, 20% of our residents now self-identify as of Asian descent, predominantly of Chinese descent. I don't see that particular number, many of the boards, committees, and commissions do not have representation of that particular ethnic group. Renters are another, Jen and I talked about, um, about class issues and about renters are often not represented uh, on boards, committees, and commissions. And the parents of very young uh, have potentially daycare needs, which are not cited in these. And I will note that I was part of the process of developing the master plan, which just came out. It's the, or, well, it came out in 2020, um, but it's called the 2030. It's the first time it was updated in, I don't know, 62 years. And there were many meetings in the Jenk Center with, you know, the typical way these are done, whiteboards all over, people putting stickies on, lots of senior citizens, very few people with young children in tow. And it's very obvious, uh, you know, if you <laughs> have to get a babysitter to go to a meeting and say, I need a babysitter <laughs> or daycare, it's a catch 22. I will tell you that the master plan for the town of Winchester does not mention daycare once. And it only uses, it's like 95 pages long, the word children only appears five times and four of those are clustered around sidewalks and and bike trails and you know that type of thing um so i asked that question maybe the needs assessments we have are not geared towards the information we want although we should look at them and, and there's a great, a huge amount of information here. The Winchester Community Needs Assessment from 2018, I've read that, it talks a lot about housing, about transportation, but others. This is the youth one that we mentioned, the Youth Beha Behavioral Health Survey. It's gonna be done again this year. And then very extensive, there's 195 pages in the Winchester Hospital Community Needs Assessment, which just came out 2022 and 13 pages in the implementation strategy for fiscal year 23 to 25. I've read all of these. Um, so if we were to move forward, these are where, in my opinion, we would take a look at what information is in there. Is it all that we need? Are we meeting the needs that are identified in those existing documents? The second component to learn from others, um, there's benefits of of talking to other people regionally. And on the next slide, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it isn't, because um, very simply, looking at any kind of a regional coalition that I'm talking about here is not what ex-Governor Baker was pushing for a while, which was to smush together um, various towns and uh, cities to create larger coalitions of health departments and boards of health, especially rural. Um, and that was over a period of time, boards of health pushed back and said in health departments arguing that individual towns know their communities best. And so that is acknowledged now. So that's not what we're talking about. 
What I'm talking about here is a very informal series of conversations and any kind of a coalition of local boards of health, as Jen and I mentioned, we, you know, we would start small, not like Middlesex County. So these are potential ones which are similar, Arlington, Bedford, Belmont, Lexington, not exclusive, wouldn't have to include those. The idea is just that a regional conversation might include those uh, towns. What are the benefits? The benefits of having regional conversations or even forming a loose coalition um, over time, like whatever that might be, meetings twice a year, or quarterly or once a year, have different benefits to Winchester than has to the state. So in this slide, I'm saying this is what I see as benefits to Winchester. One is a greater probability of getting grants. If two or more towns apply for a grant, you're more likely to get it than if you go solo. We can have sharing of educational resources and other types of expertise. For example, we recently had a monkeypox um, webinar and uh, climate change uh, webinars. And if we had advertised those regionally, we would have had more people. The impact would have been bigger and it could have been of benefit to more and collaborative public health events are possible. So this is what legal, the legal handbook says about um, what I was just saying. So the Massachusetts Department of Public Health does not any longer espouse its original objective of classical regionalization. Today, the DP, DPH remains committed to encouraging sharing of public health services across jurisdictions while maintaining the legal authority of individual boards of health. They also go on to say, uh, and this is a quote, benefits that uh, the legal got, got, uh, handbook identifies through the state lens, benefits of exploring collaborative relationships as a means of providing public health services, our consistency and equity and services provided throughout Massachusetts, um, access to a broader range of services and maximum impact for a limited number of services. So I'm going to stop uh, sharing there and see if my colleagues and health director have questions and would certainly welcome questions from others here as well after that. So Ruth, this aligns a lot with what you were, what we've talked about in terms of overall goals, right? I mean, it's, there's, there's a lot of overlap. You know, I guess the question to me is, is this another way to reframe what the goals of the Board of Health are and working with the health department? I mean, that's what it feels like to me. And if a goal is to, you know, be collaborative with other boards of health, I'm totally supportive of exploring that idea. I think that's totally a reasonable thing to think through. Um, but it feels like we already have the goals document that we started populating. Yeah. You know, whether yeah. you call it a strategic plan or a goals document, that's to me wordsmithing, honestly. Um, <laughs> but I'm happy to call it whatever we want. But I think it's I think it's true for us as a board to align with Jen and her team around goals of what we're doing and what we're supporting the health department is doing. And, and so I'm, I'm totally supportive of sort of putting it into whatever framework you think makes sense, um, whether you call it a strategic plan or a goals uh, area. And I think bucketing it around needs and, and resources makes sense. I mean, that's so I, I don't think this is that dissimilar. I maybe I'm maybe I'm missing something, but I don't think it's that dissimilar than what you've already sort of we've already been talking about. Um, <laughs> It's a, it's a great question. And it this would be follow on from the goals. We could even, if we reevaluated uh, goals annually and we come at this at March, uh, we could put that in, develop a strategic plan as one of our goals. What I'm talking about is in fact, significantly more extensive than, um, than what we have as the goals. Some strategic plans for communities like ours run 100 pages or more. I'm not talking about 100 pages. In fact, we might not even end up with a document. We don't necessarily want to tie ourselves into producing a document, but we could. It would be easy enough. If we did, I would see something um, much uh, more uh, to the point, you know, maybe five pages it might be, and probably under 20 with even appendices or so. But what is different here and what I'm really working towards, and I'm I'm anxious to hear what Maureen wants to say as well, but I just want to clarify for you, is a significant difference from the goals. What I'm talking about is really sitting down the three of us 
and having conversations and with Jen and asking the question, how well are we meeting our responsibilities and what are the opportunities we have? Again, not to give us more work, but to tie our work more strategically to long range uh, goals, if you will. For example, um, an immediate next step might be to have an upcoming uh, meeting, which I would call, I wouldn't call it so much as a retreat. So the way we developed the climate action plan, for example, when I led a team of 18 people to write that document in uh, 2019, straddling into 2020, we had 18 people who met every two weeks for two hours. We also had three retreats of half day to a full day. And we had four working groups, which met uh, untold hours. That was enormous. And that document that came out, you know, we had professionally designed and it is intended and is used by the public. This is what now guides Winchester and guides the sustainability department in terms of climate work. I'm not talking about anything that involved anything we would develop would be for our purposes. We might come up with a document which could be available to the public, but I'm envisioning, for example, a meeting, we say, let's meet for two hours in person. We would have to post it, of course, and just sit down. And that is the sole topic of conversation is a strategic plan. So looking at sitting down collectively and saying, do we see any opportunities are we, do, can we envision ways of meeting those that are different or in addition to what we're doing? How would we prioritize those? What resources might we meet, need? So it's a really, I'm asking a lot actually of you and it may not be something that feels, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, again, to clarify. So after such a meeting as that, maybe another, I don't know, two, three meetings would be held that could over time come back, you know, a month later, two months later or something. But this is just to clarify, Greg, it is significantly more than the goals. Is that clear? Is that, is that seem like a distinction? I mean, it builds off of it. It does not put aside our goals. It absolutely is, is building off of our goals. Yes, for sure. Maureen, some thoughts? Um, so I guess my thoughts are, one, in reading all those documents that you've referenced, in order to enact the strategic plan, you must feel that there are needs, needs of the community that are not being net, met and that you've identified as not being met. And so I guess, um, I guess, I'm a little bit sort of hazy on what actually it, I get with the climate action, you were creating a new department in the town, you're creating a new thing, you're creating a new sort of thing. We have an established health department, we have an established board of health, we have an established goals, we have established sort of um, charge from our community as to sort of how we're supposed to impact the community. So we're not sort of inventing what needs to happen, like what happened with the climate action committee. So I guess in my mind, I've read those, you know, different sort of hospital related things and the youth risk mm -hmm. assessments and all those things. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if what was your charge in doing this is, is that you think that there's something that we're not sort of identifying broadly in the community that we should be identifying because I, I, I guess I haven't had that feeling. So I'm just wondering sort of where it comes from. Right. No, it's a, it's a uh, totally on point question. And um, I have some thoughts that we might not be meeting all of the needs of, well, we will never gonna meet all of the needs of the community, but that there are broad areas. And those are some that I iterated earlier on um, in terms of looking at, I don't know. I don't think there is a document that tells us whether daycare needs are adequate. It would be simple enough for, um, for us to contact daycare centers in Winchester and say, how long's your waiting list, you know? Um, but I guess that's my question is, yeah. is that the charge of the Board of Health? Obviously the I... inspection and maintenance and the health maintenance and the, and the 
supervisory setting of the health department of that daycare, but whether or not there's enough daycare spots in Winchester, obviously I'd love to work on any project to help any parents with young children, whatever, but I'm not sure that that's the charge of the Board of Health to make sure that there are daycare spots in Winchester for, and I get that obviously we'd love to serve our community, but we also have to stay within our charter and what we're supposed to be focused on. No, well, I totally agree. Agreed. I agree 100%, and I think it's important for us to think. I, I actually think the framework that you set out, Ruth, of sort of assess the needs, are there policies, and are there resources that are needed? That's fair. That's, I think, a very fair thing for us to do and brainstorm within what the purview is of the Board of Health working with the health department. That, I think, is totally fair. And if there is a need that either you or any of us as a Board of Health member or anyone in the community feels like the Board of Health or Health Department should be doing more, we can add that to the needs assessment, right? Mental health is a great example, right? Mental yeah. health was not necessarily a charge of the Board of Health, um, but it has become an issue that's crept up and people have talked to us about it. And so we can think about it in that framework, you know, and how, how the coalition works and what we're doing to support that. So, I mean, I can see, you know, environmental sustainability was not necessarily, a, you know, it's a charge within a certain, but there's, so I think you can come up with these broad categories. So I'm, I'm totally fine with the idea of a meeting where we essentially whiteboard. Yes. Topics, whether that leads to a strategic plan or just sort of a, you know, a, a reaffirmation of goals, needs, policies, and resources, that's totally fair too. So I'm, I think, you know, I, I think let's, I'm supportive of, a, of assembling a meeting where we get in a room and, you know, the health department staff is there and we're there and we talk through these big, big, big picture things. I think that's totally fair as a place to start. But I don't think that we want to be inventing a charge that doesn't exist for us. I totally agree with Maureen there. And then, so just secondarily, question, uh, Ruth, like other than the daycare, which you identified, something else you identified. And in your conversations with Jen, were there areas that she feels like we should be focusing on because she has a sort of higher level, broader understanding of the community at large? And she's sort of the point of contact for most you know, if people need something in Winchester that's public health related or, or you know, Department of Health related, Jen sort of is the point of contact for a lot of that. So I'm just wondering if she's identified things that have sort of cued you into this or if there are other things other than sort of daycare placements that we should be, that you're thinking about. Because I think that we, with our goals, had sort of set expectations for ourselves that we were going to be working and meeting and not sort of just sitting back and saying, okay, COVID's over, let's just hang out for a couple of years and not do any work to improve the community. So I do agree that those goals, but I, I guess I'm, and maybe it's just my understanding, I'm not understanding sort of what this next step would be that would be different than just sort of aligning ourselves and goals and being the, you know, uh, you know, meeting the community needs as they come. Good. And I want Jen to jump in. I just want to clarify um, on whether someone said that daycare is not really like a, I, Jason Lewis has said, on, said unequivocally in one conversation I've had with him, daycare is a public health need. He sees it as a public health responsibility. That's one thing. The second is I didn't actually mean that just clarifying, I didn't mean that the Board of Health would be picking up the phone necessarily and calling daycare centers. That would, if we say that is something that needs doing, and the health department doesn't have the uh, wherewithal, the staff to take that on, then we have to identify a resource. If we say that's something that we feel the town needs to identify um, out of the town manager's office or whatever, does Win is Winchester meeting the daycare needs of our changing community where we have more and more young professionals moving in or not? That would be, you know, we set a policy and, you know, we, and then it trickles down through whatever has to happen to get an answer to that. So I just want to make that clarification, but Jen, would you uh, like to jump in and talk more about exactly what Maureen's asking and Greg? You're, you're muted, I think. No, I'm just <laughs> trying to. She's being pensive. Out. I'm just trying to figure out what, because this is my first time seeing this, you know, sort of cohesive. That's right. It's, it came out of the conversation with you. I developed it after talking to you. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So, you know, and one of my, um, so one of, one of my fears is that, you know, we have statutory obligations, we have state regulatory obligations, we have local board of health obligations 
mandates. You know, we have all of these obligations we're already required to meet. Um, it doesn't mean, though, that we are necessarily addressing all of the public health needs in this community. Therefore, I think data gathering, there's no harm in data gathering. However, I think we need to be realistic in that we may not be able to meet all of the needs in the community, as, as was said. We may not have all the resources to do it. Um, but again, there's no harm in necessarily collecting that data. We just have to have a plan for what to do with that um, once it is collected. I mean, it may bring things to light that we never knew, right? I, I suspect not, but maybe <laughs> it will. I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, Maureen, you asked a good question. Are there things that I feel like... Um, uh, you know, is there something being not addressed in the community right now? Is that was that your question? Um, yeah, I just think, like as a high yeah. level, something to initially focus on, like that right. we feel like is not being addressed that we should, you know, as I've said for a couple of years now, as we come out of COVID and we're not putting out fires constantly, we can focus more of our attention on sort of, you know, other things like historically there was huge tobacco stuff that people worked on with the Board of yeah. Health and other yeah. things like that. So I'm just saying, I feel like we're meeting our goals. I feel like we're attending to the public health of Winchester, but if there's major gaps, I would love to address those yeah, major gaps right. as best we can. But I also don't want to invent more work for you or for us if it's not necessary for the community. Yeah, and I feel like we've been tackling emerging issues as they crop up, right? Just as we did COVID, just as we are uh, mental health. Are we addressing mental health as comprehensively as a town, not just even as a health department as we should be? No. Um, but that's something we could dive into even further. And Dot and I are always, you know, talking about ways to improve and how to, you know, but again, at the end of the day, if the resources aren't there, we don't have anywhere to go with that or very few opportunities uh, or places to go. So, um, so no, I mean, currently right now, is there anything uh, like emergent or imminent that I feel like we are not addressing this? No, not necessarily. There are things we can improve upon, as I just mentioned, but um, but I don't, again, I don't know. That's why I think maybe data gathering, there's no harm in that. I'm just, I just get worried that, you know, between our statutory or regulatory obligations, can we also add you know, add more tasks or objectives or goals to that. Um, but but again, it may not all fall to the health department. I mean, when we did a survey last time, it turned out that it really wasn't, um, you know, it was building bike pathways was really a top concern and opportunities for recreation were utmost on people's minds. You know, and that's, yes, it has public health implications, but it wasn't, didn't fall under the health department to necessarily uh, solve that for the community, right? So um it would be a great town endeavor not even necessarily just a board of health endeavor <laughs> since we all could share in this um but um yeah i need to give it a lot more thought it's the first yeah. time I'm, I'm looking at that so i mean i'm happy to ruth we can continue this conversation at our next meeting or we can yep. have a separate meeting and discuss it but i mean i'm not opposed to sort of us taking a look at our goal statement that we looked at and then so, you know, having that question, are there things that we think the Board of Health or, or Health Department should be, you know, thinking about? And that's totally, I think we have been doing that. And I think it's, a, you know, it's okay to re keep re-reviewing it. I'm not, I, I don't, I, I think, again, with a small board and a small health department, there is just stuff that needs to be done and has to be done. And Jen and her team are aware of that and inform us when we need to be involved. And then there are things that the community may be asking us to think about and we can sort of address those. So I agree with Maureen. I don't want to, you know, we're not, we're not creating a new administrative bureaucracy. We're like looking to see how we can use the existing volunteerism here and the existing staff that is paid for, you know, as best as we can. And then if there are areas, then that's when you look for resources. I mean, as you said, right, the coalition wouldn't be what it was without the external grant funding, right? And so if there are other projects that we can help support through that or through other mechanisms, then we're, I think we would be on board to help with that. And, and that gets to the collaborative piece with other health departments. Sure, sure. If there's like a regional effort around other boards of health to be working on something, you know, we don't want 
we, we and we think that the town of Winchester should play and be involved. Absolutely, I'm supportive. I think so. I think I would say let's continue this conversation. But I think we I think we grounded in the goals that we already came up with because we can if we're not meeting the ability to work on those goals, then we shouldn't be adding more things. That's a fantastic response from both of you. I'm delighted that uh, you're open to ongoing conversation, which was what I was hoping. Um, and uh, yeah, it's I know it's the first time I decided not to send it to you beforehand, which I could have done an email, but it it's kind of complicated and I wanted to present it and then give you all the time you need, whether that's a month or a year, <laughs> um, to reflect on it, and uh, and we'll and we'll come back to it. Um, I would invite anyone else uh, listening in here, the health, other uh, members of the health department, or the students. Um, are there any comments that anyone would like to make? Okay, okay, very good. Thank you. So uh, we'll come back to it, whether that's an in-person meeting or not, um, or, or you know how soon to be determined. Because I'm not really we. One of the things we do need to talk about is when our next meeting will be, and whether it's too soon yet to have it in person or not. So we'll come back to that. Okay. Okay. Um, Let's see, the next thing is a student report. And as I wrote to the students, this is an invitation, just a placekeeper in the agenda so that if uh, there's something you'd like mm -hmm. to comment on, we don't overlook you. Um, from time to time, I'll put that in, but it is not an obligation to give a report. So Abby or Raymond, anything to offer at this point? Um, we haven't had anything specific recently. Um, we've just been sort of working on mental health issues within the school. And we've been conducting some research through staff and students, but we don't have a definite um, final answer yet. Great work, Abby. I mean, I would look forward to hearing when you do have something to share. Absolutely. Um, and they will be attending coalition meeting coming up. They're also working on the Martin Luther King Day of Service on the 16th. Uh, the students will be handing out COVID kits and mental health brochures, and that's going to be helping make sure they're oriented and get off to a good start on that. Thank you. Um, and may give us a report on the MLK Day of Service at our next meeting. And they're also working with Jen on uh, re some research for the health department on food plan. But all of that is all in very initial stages. So, okay. Um, approved minutes. Did uh, did both of you get a chance to look at the minutes? Yeah. Yes. Is there a motion? Uh, I can. Uh, Greg, did you get a chance to look at them? Yeah. Okay, I can make a motion to accept the minutes as presented for November 28th, 22 and 12, 12, 22. I'll second that. All in favor, Aye. Uh, Ms. Pimentel. Aye. And Dr. Swicky. Aye. And that's unanimous. So minutes are approved. All right, any old business, new business? Whoa, we're going to get out of here in a goodly amount of time. Um, is there anything else that I've forgotten? I'm not seeing it. Uh, can I just ask one question about the new business? And this is just because yes. I didn't have time to look before. Um, Jen, with the just on the mental health piece of things, tying it back on our Board of Health web page or on the Department of Public Health web page, um, I know that there were uh, a lot of centers open in the past few months of like 24 hour walk in mental health access to get direct care, like walk in clinic type urgent care for mental health. I'm just wondering if that's sort of been disseminated to the community or if it's like um, somewhere we can place it so it can get out to the community. So, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, John. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, I, I'm glad to ask that. Um, the policy went into place, what was it, January 3rd? Something <laughs> so like that, yeah. We all knew. Um, at our last meeting, we had someone from um, Winchester ER come talk a little bit about that. But um, the meeting this week, I've invited the woman from Advocates, that who we use, yep. and she's going to come and explain the policy and how it's being rolled out and so forth. So we'll have a better understanding because there's many, many people. I was talking to a um, psych, psych, um, psychiatrist from Harvard Medical School today, and she's still very fuzzy about how it's all, all going to roll out. So 
she's going to come and begin the process of explaining to us and hopefully we can keep that dialogue going and we can you know report back and, and let you know what's happened the just certain towns and locations and exactly how it's going to work yeah it's pretty well, sp splayed out on the uh, mass website yeah, like yeah. which towns are served by what's like obviously right. advocates is ours yeah. but um there's a lot more opening i guess in the next month or so so i just wanted to be able to dis right. disseminate so that January information was the date that the state said that would be rolled out okay and there's also a um a helpline for massachusetts residents yep. to find care and so we we want to condense that information um and before we promote it and, and learn just a little more from this advocates representative on thursday but we do intend to you know sort of promote that whole system which see, seemingly it should be incredibly beneficial yeah uh, for those with mental health concerns so yeah we'll definitely get the word out there but that it's it's an amazing step the state took Keep our fingers crossed. It's we're going in the right direction. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Maureen. All right. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Someone have one? Motion to adjourn. Thank you. That's unanimous. And we're done. Thanks Thank so you. much. Oh, wait, next meeting. Oh, yes. I don't oh, darn. I forgot that. Sorry. Um, yeah, when do we want to meet next? And do you want to meet in two weeks or do you prefer to take uh, extend our winter break and keep going on monthly meetings what's your druthers I, mean, I, I don't think, I think we think have month, anything to meet about in two weeks right yeah, I think monthly Pressing. is fine I think I think monthly is fine and I I yeah. would recommend I know we've got some emails going around I think we should try to do an in-person meeting unless there's absolutely no way to do it I I couldn't quite make that out Greg oh, so, I think we should have an in-person meeting next month I think that should be the okay plan. That's what we'll we'll aim for that. We'll try to locate an appropriate place. And unless something unusual happens, that's what we'll plan on doing. And so do I we want to tentatively know, say the but sixth? Just, but Sorry. I just I just actually remember that I'm actually away at a work conference on um February 6th and 7th. So I'll be in actually be out of out of the state. Um so could we do the 13th? Let's take a, a look at that. Um so February 13th. School vacation is the following week, um, yeah. and I'm away that, then. So the 13th really yeah. is the only time in February on the only day that I could be in, in person. Right. The 13th works for me. Does that work for you, Jen? And Maureen, you're... Uh, I'm just scrolling my calendar. Give me one second, yeah. but I think it's yeah. fine. Yep. Um, Thank you, Jen. Yep. Yeah, that's fine with me. Um, in person, what do we say? Do we say we're going to keep the four o'clock time, or are we going to go later? No, it seemed like people need a little more time to get home from Boston, like five thirty or something. I don't know. I'm I'm flexible. What what is needed? I'm working from home that day, so I can be flexible for anything I, after sort of four thirty. I also am actually not in Boston that day, so I could do four thirty. Jen, would that work for you? 4.30 in person on 2.13 and we can work on a, a location for that? Yeah, no problem. All right. Great. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye. 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 Recording stopped.